Hi Leute, willkommen auf 129.212.127.134 oder lass mal zu Feuer des Tages auf sillyhoon.com gehen. Ist eine Alternative äh, zu der IP-Adresse, gibt auch die Domain. Ähm, genau, der Server hier ist äh, ein Mandler-Server, immer in der neuesten Version. Ähm, und das ist sozusagen ein Werbevideo für diesen Server hier und... Ähm, Deswegen bitte ich euch doch mal hier vorbeizuschauen. Ähm, ja, es ist halt ein Anarchie-Server ohne Regeln. Könnt ihr machen, was ihr wollt. Ähm, aber hier kann jeder machen, was er will. Sprich, <lacht> wenn ihr eure Sachen nicht äh, zerstört haben wollt, dann solltet ihr lieber ein bisschen weiter weg vom Spawn gehen, um ja, ein bisschen sicherer zu sein. Wir schauen heute mal wieder ein Video von dem Fostem Channel. Ähm, ein unbekannteres Video würde ich mal sagen. Das Video hat 20 Aufrufe und ist von 2018. Und es geht mal wieder um äh, Open Source Lizenzen. Und dann würde ich sagen, äh, let's go. Das Video hat den Titel Principle Free Software License Enforcement and Open Source Company Perspective. Link zum Video ist natürlich wie immer in der Beschreibung, genauso wie die IP-Adresse dieses Servers. Okay, so I'm going to, to start. Uh, so, this talk is about GPL enforcement. Um, This is, uh, so I kind of envisioned that, that Karen and or Bradley would be in the room and this, this talk is sort of in some ways conceived of as a um, sort of troll of Karen and Bradley, but, but I think for various reasons they're, they're not going to be here because they're busy with other very important things. So that's, that's okay, that's actually maybe, maybe better um, for my purposes. But th this is kind of a, a talk about GPL enforcement from um, perspective of um, Some of us lawyers at, at Red Hat, I should, I should explain, I'm a lawyer at, at Red Hat. Um, and um, we've, been, we've been talking about this topic uh, among ourselves quite a lot recently. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit like, why this is an interesting topic to us. Um, and then like how, uh, so I want to sort of like present this sort of very, very rough tentative framework we're thinking about for how um, we're looking at the question of when is GPL enforcement appropriate, when is litigation appropriate in a GPL enforcement uh, situation, and then if, to the extent I have time, uh, I'm going to talk about some related issues that don't quite fit neatly into um, that idea of a framework. And also, um, so I should also explain, uh, this is... Um, so I usually when I give talks, they're just like, you know, my own thoughts on things. And um, this is a little bit different because some of the ideas are things that I've um, sort of developed collectively with some of my uh, colleagues at, at Red Hat on the legal team. And so that's, that's like different from the usual talk I give. But this is not, um, this is still very much, uh, you know, my own thoughts, my own perspective. Um, just influenced by some of the ideas of my, my colleagues. So it's kind of a mixture of, of uh, uh, my own ideas and my colleagues' ideas, and it's, so it's not, you know, it's not an official Red Hat talk by any means. Uh, but it, it definitely grows out of the experience uh, we've had at Red Hat and thinking about it. Okay, so why, um, why are we even uh, in Red Hat's legal department looking at this topic of GPL enforcement? I mean, so GPL enforcement's always been um, an important part of what's going on in free software and open source law, but um, it was, to, you know, to me it was like this topic that was kind of, um, in a way, minor in nature. I was sort of like primarily interested in it by the time I started working at Red Hat. I, I got interested in it because I, I noticed that there were Red Hat customers and Red Hat partners um, that were very, you know, They're very concerned about the risks of um, GPL enforcement litigation, perhaps um, unreasonably concerned. And I, um, I used to give um, talks to lawyers where I would really de-emphasize the risk of, of GPL enforcement in general, or, or open source license enforcement in general, um, which I think is actually accurate. I think that, that there really is not a lot of active enforcement of 
of these licenses, and that's actually the, one of the most interesting features of this whole system. Um, so I really tried to de-emphasize the, the risk because I saw that it was um, hindering to some degree adoption and, and um, participation by, by those companies. Uh, in recent years, this has become, I think, a more interesting topic. Um, so a few things have been happening to, uh, that sort of make it more interesting. One is that um, in the U.S. And, and maybe some other countries as well, we're, we're starting to see a bit of an uptick in GPL litigation brought by commercial entities. So uh, typically this is kind of a, a variant of a uh, what, what Bradley Kuhn calls a proprietary relicensing type of situation where you have um, a company that sort of monopolized the GPL code base and uh, is, um, for whatever reason, bringing a lawsuit um, alleging GP, uh, GPL violation, copyright infringement based on a GPL violation, uh, with, with, you know, with some sort of business goal of monetization or, or, um, or what have you. Um, so we saw that in the US with the, the, this very complex set of cases. Uh, associated with Versada and Zimpleware um, that took place a couple of years ago. Um, what's also happening, um, also in the past few years, is so the Software Freedom Conservancy, so Karen and Bradley's organization, has been, um, they've been involved with GPL enforcement really from the beginning. But I think in the past few years, they've, they've um, kind of taken on a, a more active or expanded role. So. So um, Conservancy started the GPL compliance project for Linux developers, so they started um, doing GPL enforcement for Linux kernel copyright holders, which is something they hadn't done in the past. Uh, hey, Bradley. So, um, so, so, uh, so that's like, so that, that's, that in a sense, um, in, in a political sense, uh, increased the stakes, because the, the kernel is such an important project um, commercially, and it's so pervasive that um, once, once Conservancy started doing direct GPL enforcement for kernel copyright holders, that, um, that was you know, sort of inherently uh, a, a high profile activity. Um, and then of course, um, Conservancy has been funding the, the Hell with VMware lawsuit, I guess as part of that GPL compliance project for Linux developers. Um, so that, that was filed a couple years ago. Um, and it, uh, uh, it was uh, dismissed, uh, currently on appeal, uh, I believe still on appeal. Um, but also, I don't know if anyone has heard of, well, some of you have heard of, of Patrick McCarty. So what, what's going on in parallel is uh, to Conservancy's activity and this increased commercial uh, GPL enforcement. Th there is a, uh, a Linux kernel developer named Patrick McCarty who over the past couple of years has been bringing a, a large series of lawsuits in Germany uh, alleging GPL violations. And we don't have very good information about this in, in part because um, there's, uh, the, the German civil litigation system is, is sort of very non-transparent by default. And um, so th there's been just this atmosphere of uh, rumor around uh, McCarty's yeah, lawsuit. Spicy, yeah. But there's been a lot of concern <coughs> among, um, among uh, you know, commercial entities involved in the Linux ecosystem about what McCarty has been doing. Um, basically, so we, we don't have like reliable uh, information, but what some have said is that McCarty is basically adopting a kind of extortionate sort of strategy around bringing litigation, um, sort of, uh, in a sense, getting uh, companies to agree to these settlements which have penalty clauses, and then the penalty clause is triggered by a, an allegation of a subsequent GPL violation. and. Uh, it's sort of, uh, it, it, it apparently, um, from what we're told by some who claim to have knowledge about this, McCarty has been you know, uh, amassing significant um, uh, damage awards or settlement awards uh, based on this, this kind of strategy. So, so the assumption that his, the motivation of McCarty has been, uh, in a sense, uh, wealth acquisition rather than um, compliance per se, or compliance for some sort of social purpose. So, um, the um, Conservancy and the FSF published uh, last year, I think, or the year before, uh, a set of uh, principles of community-oriented GPL enforcement. Um, you should, you know, look it up. I, I won't go into into them here. Um, actually, I don't think that that Conservancy has actually given public talks about the details of these principles. But I, I, I think these principles clearly came out of the concern 
over McCarty and a, and a desire to um, emphasize the difference between conservancies, uh, uh, you know, rationale and methodology for bringing GPL enforcement and um, McCarty's tactics or alleged tactics. So, so that's the, the, the purpose, I think, the primary purpose that, that um, the principal will serve. So um, why is this interesting to read out? So I mean, one, one interesting thing is that I mean, companies have not really publicly talked about this issue at all. Um, Karen and Bradley talk a lot about GPL enforcement. Um, you, you know, we, we, we just, we don't really see companies publicly um, willing to talk about this issue. There's, there's a lot of back channel discussion among uh, especially legal representatives of companies about um, McCarty and so forth. But um, no one's really, no one from a, from a corporate point of view is really talking about this issue. So we Jeez. sort of think that it's that's probably it's time good, for it? a company that's, you know, especially involved in a lot of uh, development of GPL licensed open source software to start talking about this. Um, for, for Red Hat, it's particularly significant for a lot of reasons. Red Hat distributes lots of upstream GPL software. Red Hat uses the GPL for a lot of the software it develops. Um, Red Hat has a lot of uh, employees who uh, contribute to GPL licensed projects. Um, many of these employees, I would say, are sympathetic to the GPL enforcement being done by the Conservancy, and we're you know, certainly aware of that. They're very frustrated by um, the, the degree of non-compliance, I think, that they, they see. So, so it's very... Um, uh, for, for multiple reasons, because Red Hat is kind of standing in a lot of these different worlds uh, surrounding the GPL, it's, it's very relevant for us uh, as, a, as a topic. So uh, our perspective um, is, so, so first, um, you know, we, I think there's been this, this assumption that companies are just sort of um, unthinkingly opposed to GPL enforcement. Um, our, uh, we we want to emphasize that that there is uh, a place for, certainly for GPL enforcement, um, and uh, you know, the question is how much enforcement should there be? Um, what is, what, what um, tactics should be used? So we've, we actually think that conservancy's principles are a really good starting point. Um, conservancy is really the first group to try to articulate, you know, what, uh, what, what kinds of, um, uh, characteristics, uh, legitimate versus illegitimate GPL enforcement should have. So a very good starting point, we think that that um, there is more that can be said about the topic and, and we kind of want to, we sort of see ourselves as, as starting to think about contributing to uh, a dialogue on this topic that, that since Conservancy started. So it, it, we have a kind of rough, uh, very rough tentative kind of framework that we're discussing about this uh, where we we think about, you know, what are the objectives of, uh, legitimate objectives of GPL enforcement and GPL compliance? And, and then um, what are the characteristics that, that, um, that such enforcement should have? And then what kinds of tactics are appropriate for, for that kind of enforcement? Okay, so uh, objectives. So for, for us, um, you know, if, if you go to, uh, Conservancy's talks on GPL enforcement, I think they'll probably emphasize the, the traditional uh, conception of what the goals of the GPL are. So, so um, uh, maximizing or protecting user freedoms, for example. Uh, we, you know, our view is, is kind of different in perspective, and we, we certainly recognize the importance of, uh, of user freedoms as part of the design of, of the GPL, what the GPL is, is, is designed to do. But from our point of view, the, the goal that we, we think we want to achieve uh, from GPL compliance is uh, promoting more collaboration and promoting more, more participation in, in development. And, and I don't want this to sound like it's kind of a sort of an old fashioned type of open source versus free software thing, because that's not really how, and certainly not how I conceive of it. It's, uh, we see um, social as well as economic benefits to to participation in free software projects, including copyright projects, and uh, and we want to promote uh, both the social and, and, and the ethical and the um, commercial benefits. And the other objective that we have, have sort of been formulating is this notion of a, of a level playing field among vendors. So the GPL uh, is something that that um, attempts to achieve this level playing field, uh, to, and it's actually sort of subsidiary to the previous one because it, it the level playing field sort of promotes. Um, more participation in, in the system. Okay, 
so the collaboration, so the, the collaboration goal, um, you know, so this kind of implies that the goal is not compliance per se or compliance at all costs. It's uh, G GPL compliance should aim to maximize promoting um, collaboration and participation, including commercial uh, investments and commercial participation. And um, it should be measured by, you know, the, ex the extent to which it achieves that kind of goal. Uh, you know, it, the, we, we've been talking a lot about, about this idea of uncertainty, that, um, that the more uncertainty you have surrounding um, the GPL and GPL compliance and GPL enforcement, um, the, you know, I, I, the more concern there is about, about um, discouraging participation. So there's a certain point where, where um, um, GPL enforcement activity might be negative in nature because it discourages rather than promotes participation. And the level playing field idea. Um, so, so the 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 nature of the GPL is this um, this you know this basic rule of copyleft that, that um, distributors can't impose any further restrictions on downstream users. Uh, th th this is um, something that that I think Conservancy actually has emphasized in some of their talk that that um, the. This, the shared expectation of, of the no further restrictions rule creates an incentive to contribute to GPL licensed products. So, so we we um, we certainly agree with that. Um, and um, this is you know historically this was a big motivation for many companies that got involved in, in Linux development. Um, the, the the idea that all participants, all corporate participants, would be held to the same rules was a big uh, sort of motivator that they would all be limited in their ability. To proprietize this call or, or prevent it from proprietizing the code. So when you have non-compliance, this has the tendency to reduce participation because um, because then you no longer have this shared uh, uh, the rules are no longer being uh, observed by all participants. So um, the, the the system is not really working properly when you have some companies out of compliance. So. Um, Based on those kinds of objectives, we've we've been thinking about you know what are the what are the I, I say the lowercase p principles um, because I don't want to kind of confuse this with the principles that Conservancy and FSF have been talking about. It's it's um, these are more like the, the characteristics of uh, enforcement that's um, that we see as sort of legitimate versus illegitimate, so um, or 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 well intended versus not well intended. Uh, and th so there are four basic um, um, principles or characteristics. Predictability, um, enforcement should not be done for gain, for financial gain, um, and transparency, uh, the importance of transparency and the importance of resolving conflicts of interest uh, surrounding enforcement. So I'll, I'll talk about some of these uh, in uh, a little more detail. So the, the predictability is just a very high level kind of characteristic. This is just the idea, you know, I talked about uncertainty. So, so um, enforcement should be um, done in a way that is predictable. Um, it should not be done for what will, you know, be perceived as arbitrary reasons because that the arbitrariness is going to um, reduce the incentive of companies to be in compliance. Uh, and now, the, the idea that enforcement should not be done for, for financial or personal gain, this is something that that Conservancy and the FSF have emphasized, so we totally agree with that um, as, a, as a fundamental principle. So, uh, you know, why, it's kind of obvious why this, this is bad. So, so to, to do enforcement for personal gain, the, the way, um, uh, for example, Patrick McCarty is alleged to be doing. Uh, you know, so enforcement that's done for personal gain uh, is going to be, it's going to increase that uncertainty because, you know, you, um, why should a, why should a company um, invest in compliance if they just don't they don't really know uh, you know they, they're trying to play by the rules but they don't know if they're going to be um, you know enforced against uh, for some reason having nothing to do with um, the goal of, of um, furthering compliance for its own sake. Um, this also you know enforcement for personal gain just just um, increases cynicism around um, the whole topic of GPL compliance so. So the GPL sort of loses respect because uh, enforcement and compliance is seen as something that is um, not done for um, social or ethical reasons, but rather for financial gain. 
Uh, and copyleft is seen um, as something that um, you have to worry about, so a cause for concern, rather than something that is supposed to benefit the community. Uh, and this, this concern fits in with things I've you know, talked about in the past, um, about proprietary relicensing, about that business model, which is now a bit outdated, but still to some degree with us. Uh, so proprietary relicensing creates, um, that, that business model creates incentives for um, um, unreasonably aggressive enforcement tactics and um, what some people would call shakedowns and uh, in, in sales tactics and, and also encourages the, the companies that adop, uh, operate those kinds of business models to um, promote very restrictive, unreasonably restrictive interpretations of the GPL. So this is, this will, you know, for many years this was a concern uh, that w that surrounded my SQL AB, uh, for example, and, and other companies that, that that use similar models. So it fits in with what, what we've said about you know what, what certainly I've talked about in the past about about that topic. The um, transparency pr um, value is something that that Conservancy and FSF have not really talked about in this context. So we think it's something that that's really been missing from from discussion of this topic. So uh, you might say that, that Conservancy has put forward this um, model uh, in, in which nonprofit organizations, uh, especially charitable ones, um, or, or, or specifically charitable ones, play a, uh, should play a prominent role in, in um, license enforcement. Um, that being the case, the, the, um, it becomes very important to have adequate disclosure of um, donor relationships for those kinds of organizations. Uh, we we don't really see uh, the the kind of disclosure that exists today being adequate in, in sort of giving giving us um, uh, enough of a degree of confidence about the motivations for GPL enforcement. So so we, we think there has to be some pretty high standard for for disclosure of um, uh, funding relationships for um, entities that are engaged in GPL enforcement as nonprofits. The, um, another thing that, that another uh, issue that, that should be discussed in a, in a transparent way is um, you know the, just the methodology for deciding um, if you if you do go to litigation um, why do you pick one company as a target versus another so if you're suing um, you know, you're suing the given, given company what led you to that decision um, when there are other companies that are engaging in the, the same kind of violation. Uh, uh, also, this is maybe a, a fairly controversial point. The, um, thinking about, about both McCarty and um, the Hell with the VMware case, we've been really concerned about the, the, um, the sort of uh, by default secret nature of the German civil litigation system. In this respect, so there, there's a lot of benefits to the, the German civil procedure system relative to what we have in the United States. It, one, one big disadvantage that, that exists is in, in the U.S., um, the, you know, the facts about litigation are public by default. Uh, it's the opposite situation in Germany where, where um, when a litigation is going on, the, it's very difficult to get information about, about, um, about those cases. And this has, this has been, I think, sort of used by, um, based on what we hear, by litigants like um, by, by, by Patrick McCarty. Uh, because it, the secrecy surrounding the litigation has um, made it made it difficult, if not impossible, for companies that are targets or potential targets uh, of of his litigation to share information and share strategies and so forth. So, so the secrecy um, secrecy is, is is very damaging. Um, so, you know, all things being equal. Non-transparent litigation forums should perhaps be disfavored. There, there should be a higher burden to justify bringing a lawsuit in a, in a jurisdiction like Germany, um, or in some way the, the, the problem of the, the non-transparency should be addressed. Uh, and um, I also, the one thing that that conservancy and FSF do emphasize in the principles is uh, the importance of confidentiality, which is kind of uh, at odds with this, this emphasis on transparency. So um, we would say that 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 um, maybe they're overstating the value of, of confidentiality. Uh, perhaps we should be having more information disclosed about enforcement cases, um, including those that, that, are, that have not gone to litigation. 
Uh, and then uh, an issue that has really been ignored um, almost completely, maybe completely, is, is the issue of conflict of interest. So conflict of interest arise in GPL enforcement, and uh, we would say that um, you know these should be acknowledged, they should be disclosed, and addressed and resolved in some way. So the, um, the main concern is uh, this idea of divided loyalties. So uh, if an employee of a company gets involved in GPL enforcement activity, that activity might be in conflict with duties that they have to their employer. Uh, imagine if uh, the GPL enforcement involves some some product of the employer or some part, business partner of the employer or uh, a major customer of the employer. So there are all sorts of possibilities for how uh, an employee getting involved in GPL enforcement could um, kind of create a conflict, a conflict of interest um, in relation to the, the employee status as an employee of some company. Um, this doesn't mean that if such conflict exists, the enforcement shouldn't go on or, or, or any, anything like that. It's just that th this, um, these issues have to be, um, have to be made visible and, and they have to be resolved in some way. And they could be resolved in a way that would facilitate the enforcement to happen. It's, it's uh, just that this, uh, this issue has been, um, as I say, kind of ignored. And I think to the extent that, that we sort of get close to talking about it, 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 it comes up in a way when we talk about um, copyright ownership. Uh, uh, and that's something that conservatives talk about a lot. But the, even if employees have copyright ownership of their, of their uh, work, um, their contribution to GPL licensed projects, that doesn't um, eliminate this conflict of interest. Because you, you could have copyright on, uh, on code, and you, you could still um, give rise to a conflict of interest situation um, if you have uh, you know, an employee who, have, who has a duty to an employer, or, or you know, there could be other issues as well. Like you, you maybe, maybe you have uh, your uh, business partner, and there's some conflict uh, caused by your GPL enforcement activity in relation to your business partnership, or uh, various various po possibilities. The one that we've kind of thought about a lot is, is this employment uh, situation. Okay, and. Um, and then, so what, what tactics are appropriate given the, those kinds of objectives and characteristics of, of um, um, you know, good GPL enforcement? What are the appropriate tactics? So here um, we, we say you know, education is very important and litigation should be a last resort. These are also emphasized in the conservancy and FSF principles, but there's a, a kind of a difference in, in uh, some of the details we talk about. So uh, we agree with, with uh, conservancy that, you know, Non-compliance is generally a problem of, of education and awareness, um, and this can be addressed in, in many, many cases by working with um, with the non-compliant company to um, learn about how they can come into compliance. Uh, and, and so you know, it, it, there should be a big emphasis on finding ways to facilitate self-compliance by, um, by a, a target company that, that uh, is, is not compliant with GPL. Uh, in, in talking about education, we don't. Um, I, I would distinguish that from the the uh, separate topic of general education initiatives around um, license compliance, which may have some value themselves. But but I think the general education around compliance and, and learning about you know licensing and so forth and and um, enabling better tools for compliance. That's not really going to address the the kinds of GPL non-compliance that I think, for example, Conservancy or the FSF um, or other GPL license products have to deal with. So that's kind of a, it, it's more the one-on-one -on -one education that we're talking about. And um, so everyone says that litigation should be a, a last resort, and um, you know we certainly agree strongly with that. Um, but I, I think I, I would say that, that uh, we, we would emphasize this more than we think. Um, uh, yeah, I don't really so, so, so you know, what's what's wrong with with litigation as a solution to to um, GPL non-compliance? So litigation is just a really bad um, mechanism. It's a it's a bad tool. It's it's um, oh, no. yeah. too highly structured. It's very expensive, very time consuming. The rules differ from locality to locality. So just not not a well designed mechanism for achieving compliance in general. 
Uh, it uh, also has the, the, the detrimental feature that it, it is basically a form of shifting um, power away from developers and towards judges. Judges who, in general, are not going to be familiar with the technology or the um, kind of cultural or social background you need to have to understand how the GPL is actually interpreted in the community. The outcome of uh, litigation can be very bad, and you can get bad results. And this can sometimes be heavily dependent on the knowledge level or skill level of um, the lawyers on, on the various sides of the litigation dispute. So it, it actually, you know, litigation tends to increase uncertainty uh, on, along one dimension. Uh, and the, um, you know, the visibility of litigation, of course, is going to have some effect on, on making companies very concerned and, uh, about risk and so forth. Uh, my colleague, Scott Peterson, has, has written this um, interesting article that kind of relates to this, this concern about litigation. He says that um, open source licenses are shared resources. And what he means is that, that in, in this system, licenses like the GPL are, are reused extensively from project to project. And um, that's really something that makes um, free software and open source very different from other, um, other forms of uh, uh, software license. We don't see this in proprietary software license. We don't see that, that um, reuse of standard license text. And the, the problem with this is that uh, when you have litigation, um, the, the effect of one, one lawsuit brought by one litigant can be very extensive. If, um, uh, if the lawsuit results in a, in a particular result, which may, you know, you know, it's as likely that the results can be very bad from the perspective of someone concerned about the integrity of interpretation of the GPL as, uh, as it might be good. So, so, you know, there's at least um, a high risk of a uh, really bad result from a... Ich glaube, das war das erste Statement von ihm, was ich in dem Video verstanden habe, oder die erste Sache, die ich mitgenommen habe. Leute, was ist denn da los in dem Video? You can't easily, so these licenses are not easy to update. Um, GPL was updated uh, three times over a period of 25 years. So it's not, th these licenses are not really well designed for uh, frequent updates. Um, and so you're kind of stuck with a, a license text and a set of bad legal rules. So the, you know, the counter argument is that um, litigation is potentially beneficial because you get more certainty. Um, the problem is that sometimes um, uh, less certainty is actually more beneficial because because of the risk of a bad result. So anytime litigation is contemplated in, in a GPL enforcement context, you have to consider the likelihood of a of a bad result uh, based on you know what the what the facts and the legal issues are. Um, and so you know what kind of follows from this is that you know, what's the, the most appropriate kind of GPL enforcement case that will be brought to litigation. So it would, you know, it, it would be one where you don't have um, uh, strong disagreement on the underlying legal interpretive issues, and the risk of a really bad result in terms of like uh, GPL interpretation is relatively low. And also, these are going to be cases. Uh, so the intransigent aspect is that these will be cases where you know education is just not going to work. You have a repeat violation. Um, and so this kind of this kind of sounds to me kind of like the. Um, the busy box cases that were brought several years ago. So I think they fit well in, in this kind of clear and intransigent standard. Um, I'm not so sure that that VMware lawsuit really fits in well with this kind of standard. Uh, so there's there's um, a subtopic here of um, defensive DPL claims. So uh, there have been a few notable cases where companies have been sued uh, based on some legal theory, and they brought a counterclaim or uh, uh, a lawsuit against the person, the company suing them, based on a, 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 an allegation of GPL violation. Uh, and so, it, uh, three examples uh, that I know of are SCO v. IBM. So, SCO sued IBM many years ago. IBM brought a GPL violation counterclaim against SCO. Red Hat was sued by a, um, uh, a patent, not, not a patent troll exactly, but a, but a company that was sort of transitioning from operating entity to patent troll called Twin Peaks. And um, Red Hat brought a counterclaim based on GPL violation. And uh, another one that didn't involve the GPL is uh, Jacobson versus Katzer, where um, 
Katzer sued Jacobson or Jacobson's company um, alleging patent infringement, and then Jacobson sued Katzer alleging a violation of the artistic license. And this resulted in a, uh, a you know, helpful uh, legal ruling in the U.S. that that um, open source licenses, suggesting open source licenses can uh, be enforced through copyright law. Um, but notice that the, the lower court decision in Jacobson v. Katzer went the other way, and so if, if the, the appellate court had gone the other way and agreed with the lower court, we would have had one of those really bad cases. And you know, several years ago, this is what many of us were worried about. So we were kind of lucky with Jacobson v. Katzer. Um, anyway, so, so with defensive GPL claims, we think these should be subject to um, a different kind of standard because they don't really raise the same kinds of concerns that um, um, the typical GPL uh, enforcement claims and litigation will, will raise. So there isn't the same concern about um, about abuse. Um, there's no real notion of doing this for a financial gain. These are done because you've been sued by some company and you want to stop the lawsuit. Um, this is not a matter of the GPL um, litigant trying to find targets to sue Oops. because the, the, the target has already selected itself because the target has brought a lawsuit against the, um, the defendant. And these, these cases, the ones that have, have occurred in, in the, the real world so far, have all involved some kind of legal threat to free software. So patent infringement against free software code base um, uh, in two of the cases. And then in the case of SCO, a, you know, a, a very broad sort of dangerous um, uh, copyright infringement violation, basically. So, uh, so defensive GPL claims, we think, don't won't raise, raise the same concerns and should be uh, kind of used mm -hmm. by a kind of lower standard. I think um, Bradley Kuhn has, has uh, spoken otherwise. He's kind of criticized Red Hat for having um, settled with um, Twin Peaks. Um, but, so. but I think that, that you know, yeah, the, the way litigation works is it, it, it kind of motivates you to, to compromise and, and settlement. And I think it's kind of, to the extent that Bradley was sort of suggesting that, that you should sort of fight to the bitter end and make sure that, that you're going to bring one of these counterclaims, make sure that you uh, fight to the very end so that you win. That I think that that's just not really a realistic view of, of how the litigation system works. But again, as, as I say, the, the concerns that arise with um, um, uh, non-defensive GPL claims don't really arise in that context. Um, so that was sort of the, the, the framework, the tentative framework that we've been talking about, very kind of rough as you can see, but, it's, but you can see that we're sort of building upon the ideas that Conservancy started to talk about and thinking about, you know, what, what is Conservancy overlooking? What are some, some um, uh, issues that really need to be brought to the fore when thinking about when GPL enforcement is appropriate or not, when litigation is appropriate or not? Um, there's a few other issues that I've thought about that relate to this a little bit um, in more or less direct or indirect ways. And I'll just, um, in the remaining time I have, I will talk about this. So, um, one thing is this, uh, I call this back channels problem. So, so one of the problems I see in uh, the current state of affairs is that we have different entities that are concerned about GPL enforcement. Um, they aren't all really talking to each other um, fully. So we have uh, these, uh, these uh, opportunities for companies to talk to each other about, you know, concerns about McCarty and how to think about GPL compliance. Um, but th th these, um, these forums are not really open to all stakeholders in the, in the GPL enforcement uh, world. So uh, I think that we should move away from this um, tendency to have these um, closed forums that are not open to everyone. And uh, I'd like to see us uh, have a more uh, multilateral kind of dialogue on these issues. And I think not having that multilateralism tends to just escalate um, the divisiveness that surrounds this whole topic. Um, I also think that some of the rhetoric that I hear from conservancy around GPL enforcement is maybe also um, problematic in some ways. The rhetoric, which I mean, I've kind of engaged in it myself in this talk a little bit, is kind of aggressive and almost kind of violent in nature. So, so the um, the very term enforcement is sort of suggestive of force, violent force. And um, I don't, I, I mean, apart from compliance, I don't have a good alternative uh, phrasing to use. But, but I think there's something to be said for thinking about about rhetoric. And I don't want to sound like a tone police, but 
But I think uh, um, possibly the, the divisiveness around this whole topic could be improved by thinking more about how, you know, the kind of language we use. Um, well, so Ted Cho has raised an interesting issue of like who should really have the authority to enforce. We have a project like the Linux kernel with lots of copyright holders. Um, you know, is it really appropriate for um, a representative of a minority of those copyright holders to enforce? This is, um, I think it's Ted suggested that maybe Lena should be the one to, to make the decisions because that, after all, he ultimately makes decisions for what goes into the Linux kernel. I don't think Lena is interested in doing that. But I do think that, that you know, when you have a project like the kernel, you have lots of corporate copyright holders as well as individual copyright holders. The, the corporate copyright holders are stakeholders as well, and they ought to have some, some sort of say in um, how enforcement gets done. I don't really have a good idea for how that can be done, but I, I, I can envision some more multilateral um, way of dealing with this. Um, when, when we first had this dev room, Loïc Dachary uh, gave this talk about uh, basically saying that um, it is possible for, for companies to enforce the DPL without being corrupt. Um, I actually, I'm not sure I agree with what he said in that talk entirely, um, because I, I think that when individual companies bring DPL litigation, it's sort of inherently suspect. But maybe there's a way of multilaterally addressing the GPL non-compliance problem involving companies. Uh, and I think um, I'll just close on this this uh, point that, that I think one you know one of the concerns we have about uh, when you hear about the McCarty lawsuit is that he's bringing um, he's alleging very uh, frivolous or or uh, questionable interpretations of the GPL that are inconsistent with how I would say we we tend to. Uh, assume the GPL should be interpreted in, in the community. And so maybe we can address that by having projects um, do more of an effort than they do today of documenting how they interpret the GPL as applied to the issues that arise in, in a given project. So, so maybe we could have the kernel start to put down on paper um, uh, an attempt to kind of derive some kind of consensus view on, um, you know, for example, the proprietary kernel module issue or, or any number of other issues that can arise in GPL. Um, enforcement issues in, or GBL compliance issues in the kernel. Uh, so I don't know if there's time left for questions, but I'm going to end it there. Is there enough questions done? Yeah, that's good. Questions. We do have a couple of minutes for questions, and I'm going to start. So, uh, Richard, you've mentioned a number of things that kind of go beyond Conservancy's principles of GPL enforcement, and you've made a pretty strong statement that, that Red Hat is actively thinking about that. So my question for you is, do you kind of envision that this is a, a trend? Do you want to be a model? Do you want Red Hat to sort of set the tone that maybe other companies will actively think about this and come up with their own principles of GPL enforcement? Do you think I'm not done? Do you think that we're going to have Oracle principles for GPL enforcement and IBM principles of GPL enforcement, sort of like we had vanity open source licenses back in the day, or alternatively, is it are you making a call for the community to come together and harmonize around principles for GPL enforcement? Yeah, it's the, it's, a, it's the latter, of course. We don't want each company to come up with its own principles. We want to have, uh, we actually want to have the whole community come together and agree on um, what those principles should be. So Richard, you talked about it being uh, important in your view, uh, as I understand it, for uh, organizations doing GPL enforcement to provide clarity and transparency in terms of things like who will get sued, you know, you know, and to make sure that that decision is not capricious or arbitrary. I can understand the value of that, but surely the difficulty is then that you end up with the whole, I don't have to run faster than the line, I just have to run faster than you thing, where every company brings themselves into kind of minimalist compliance just beyond the next worst company in the list according to the principles, such that somebody else will get sued apart from them. And whereas normally you would negotiate with a company saying we would like full compliance, please, uh, you, you, they would just say, go, well, as long as we're doing better than so-and-so, your principles say you're going to sue them and not us. Um, okay. I, I don't, yeah, I'll have to think about that. Uh, maybe, Brad. Uh, so I hope I can be indulged with two questions since you mentioned me, I think, 23 times during a talk. Um, no photos. No, sorry? No, no photos of you. 
I was I was in the back. I could hear the whole thing. Um, so so uh, first of all, you, you you claim that the defensive lawsuit against Twin Peaks meets your lower class P principles. Uh, in fact, I think it doesn't on every count. Um, it was not transparent. Uh, there was no discussion with the community about what you were doing. Um, it was not predictable because as a complete surprise, in the end of that lawsuit, a Red Hat executive declared that proprietary kernel modules are not required to be under GPL. And I suppose it resulted, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, in, it's on archive.org, you can read the deposition. Um, uh, I, I would assume you have. Uh, so I, I'm, sort of un, I'm sort of completely confused about your argument that that, that Oh, the, oh, basically, you're, you're the only lawsuit you said fit your principles is basically Red Hat's one against Twin oh, Peaks. No, no, no. So, so I, maybe I didn't explain this well enough. I'm saying that these defensive um, counterclaim issues shouldn't be held to the same standard. So, so um, to some degree, I guess you're right about like, you know, the, the point you're making about transparency, for example. It doesn't meet the same standard of transparency that I'm suggesting should be part of how we think about you know, GPL enforcement should be done. But I'm saying that's okay because it's li it's a confined uh, issue. It's, it's the, the defensive, it, because it's defensive in nature. It doesn't raise the same kinds of concerns about about abuse and so forth that arise in a non-defensive context. So, so I probably didn't explain that. So my second question is: is you, you you just answered Tom's question saying yes, you want to engage in the process of discussing in the principles in a way. Um, there has been multiple forms available since the principles were published to do that. I haven't seen you or Red Hat do that. Instead, we have a surprise talk where you criticize everything about our principles uh, and didn't even tell us you were going to do that. So, so I'm a little confused, like why, why, why you're saying you want to have discussion, but you aren't engaging in the forms that exist. They're public and transparent to discuss the principles. So, so first of all, my view is that I think it would be a great idea for Red Hat to participate in development of the principles, so evolution of the principles going forward. I don't know if that's that's my own personal view. I don't know if that's a view of like some of my colleagues, um, but um, I don't think it was a surprise talk because you were one of the people who voted to um, have it in the demo. I'm sorry. Time for one really quick question. Oh. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you, how much do you think uh, the SEO lawsuits of done reputational damage to this whole field of GPL, including GPL uh, litigation, um, and then how much, because this is kind of something I missed in your presentation, what are you going to do to kind of take away that negative feeling that those lawsuits have given to the whole field of leg uh, legislation, uh, enforcement? Um, well, I, I don't, I mean, the, the SCO lawsuits are now kind of really, like, deeply in the past. I think we've got, so at the time there was a lot of concern about, about whether, um, you know, free software was legally dangerous, but that, that was a long time ago, and I think everyone kind of got beyond that. The, the SCO lawsuits were seen to be ultimately, you know, essentially frivolous in nature, and so I, I, I don't think that that's an issue anymore. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> Okay, das war das Video Principal Free Software License Enforcement and Open Source Company Perspective von Red Hat, wie es aussieht, von dem YouTube Channel Fostem. Link zu den Videos wie immer in der Beschreibung, genauso wie die IP-Adresse und auch die Domain zu diesem Minecraft Server hier, dass ihr hier ein bisschen Vanilla spielen könnt. Ähm, hier gibt es keine Regeln, Vanilla einfach pur, könnt ihr machen, was ihr wollt und äh, ganz entspannt vor euch hin leben. Ähm, dann würde ich sagen, sehen wir uns im nächsten Video dieser, in der nächsten Folge dieser Dauerwerbesendung. Und woher kommt, wo ist denn hier diese Lava Source? What the fuck? Okay, naja, dann ähm, sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge. Ciao.